Grace to all of you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to the service of worship here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. If you are a guest with us this morning, then we want to extend to you a special welcome and invite you after the service, please stick around, have a cup of coffee, have a bite to eat, introduce yourselves to us, let us know whatever questions you have about our family, about our ministries, about our fellowship here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. If you're joining us over the internet, we thank you for doing that as well, and the same invitation is extended to you also. If you're ever in the city, if you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by, have a cup of coffee, have something to, uh, something to eat. Let us get to know you in the same way uh, that you have come to know us through our services. We have a couple of very quick announcements before we bring our hearts and minds together for worship. First, uh, if you would uh, sign a card. There's a card on the table at coffee hour um, that is for Cheryl Dudley's nephew, Zane, uh, who was born several weeks ago and was born premature. So we want Cheryl and her extended family and certainly Zane and his parents and caregivers uh, to know that we are thinking and praying for them. So we have a card at coffee hour. If you would sign it and write a note so that we could mail that, that would be appreciated. Secondly, if you have ever felt the Spirit move inside of your heart and guiding you to either usher or, or provide coffee hour, now is your chance. This is as close as it comes to an altar call at Madison Avenue Baptist Church, y'all. Somebody needs to respond. I don't want to make Paul sing 16 verses of Just As I Am. So. Please see Jackie after church. The volunteer list for coffee hour and ushering is running a little thin for the rest of the summer and fall. It is very easy. Uh, it is very low-key. Uh, it provides a, a nice sugar rush for all of the children after service, uh, which is part of the experience here. Uh, and if you feel like you're intimidated uh, to usher, speak to Flo. Today is her first time ushering. Flo, thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> Finally, Cheryl. Yes, you have an announcement. Uh, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to implore that um, we have a good time together. Usually I'm up here to ask you to come and do miniature golf or go to a baseball game. Well, this summer, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do a picnic on Governor's Island. So August 24th is a Saturday. That's the day that we picked. Um, we want to um, have people meet who's interested in front of the church. You need to sign up, though, so we know who we're waiting for. Uh, we'll take public transportation to get over to the ferry. Um, the ferry is free on Saturdays. We have to get there early though because the line is long because the ferry is free. Um, but we would like for you, if you're interested, please let us know, sign up. There'll be a sign up at coffee hour today. Um, it'll be out there for the next couple of Sundays for you to um, just put your name down and let us know if you're interested in all we ask is that you um, bring something to eat, drink, or whatever, and maybe a blanket or two um, whatever it is that you need to be comfortable sitting on the ground or whatever, having a nice picnic with, um, as a social gathering. Uh, we, if you are one of the people that, you know, it's more convenient for you to meet us at the ferry, you could still sign up and just let us know that. Um, but we would like to be able to just try this for the first summer that we're going to do to do a, a picnic at Governor's Island. If you've never been there before, it's got a beautiful view of, of New York Harbor including the Statue of Liberty. So, um, and there's also biking. If you could bring your bike, if you don't have a bike, you can rent a bike. It's a little expensive to ride a, um, rent a bike there, but you can do it, okay? So if anybody's interested and need more information, my email is in the bulletin, and also you can see me at coffee hour. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Are there any other announcements? If not, then let us begin our time together as we do each week by exchanging signs and words of Christ's peace with our neighbors. Please.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has ordained his blessing forevermore. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 236, Wind Who Makes All Winds That Blow, Let Us Stand As We Are Able, and sing together hymn number 236.
If you would, please bow with me in prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, one of the striking things when we look at Scripture is that from beginning to end, it is the story of you coming after us. In the beginning, in Genesis, Adam and Eve try to hide from you, and yet you come and find them. In Revelation, in the end, your heavenly Jerusalem descends to this earth. You make your home with us as family. And then certainly, O Lord, right there in the middle, You come to us in flesh and blood as Emmanuel, as God who is with us. Over and over again, you come to us. Over and over again, we are reminded that you are with us. Over and over again, we are reminded that there is nothing that can keep us from the power of your love. There is nothing that we can do. There is nothing that we can fail to do. There is nothing that can be done to us. There is nowhere that we can go. There is nothing to which we might be subject that can keep us from the power and presence of your Spirit, that can separate us from your love. And so in that sure and that certain knowledge, we come to you this morning as your children, and we come to you in prayer. We pray for those areas of our lives and those areas of our world where we wonder sometimes if you are there. Those areas of our lives and those areas of our world where it feels like the good is gone. Where it feels like hope has been lost. Where it feels like we are alone with no one left to turn to. And so we turn to you now. We pray that your spirit will fall on all these areas. We pray that it will fall in such a way that its presence can be felt palpably. That its presence cannot be denied. That its graces will overwhelm whatever it is that is going on and we are reminded of those old hymn words. That though the wrong seems oft so strong, you indeed are the ruler yet. And so now in this time of silence, on hearts and minds and indeed on lips, we lift up to you the cares and concerns of our hearts and the cares and concerns of our world. Gracious and holy Lord, we know that we can always and everywhere come to you in prayer. But we also know that we can always and everywhere come to you in prayer because you have always and in all places already come to us. That you have sought us out, that you have chosen us, that you have loved us. That you have loved us to the point that you have counted the hairs upon our heads. 
for that we say thank you. And we pray that you will never, ever allow us to forget it. And we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we close this time of prayer with the words that he gave us to offer back up to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our time of worship, our second hymn this morning is number 453, called as partners in Christ's service. Let us stand as we are able and sing together hymn number 453.
please be seated. Our scripture lesson today comes from the sixth chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. I'll read verses 1 through 11 and then pick up again at verse 39. One Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked some heads of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come, stand here. So the man got up and stood there, and then Jesus said to them all, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at all of them, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And the man did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of the heart, produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts upon them. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, when, when you read the stories of Jesus in the Gospels, it really is striking just how much he is in conflict with the religious leaders around him. Now, it's not really the case that they're always in direct opposition, but, but it is the case that over and over again we are shown how they and Jesus simply aren't on the same page. And we see two examples of this this morning in the first half of today's reading. In the first, Jesus' disciples are hungry, and so he lets them eat. In the second, A man comes to him with a crippled hand, and Jesus heals him. And in both cases, the religious leaders who see these things are shocked. Here in Luke 6, in both of these stories, their shock is because Jesus seems to disregard the law of Moses. Specifically, he seems to disregard the fourth of the Ten Commandments about properly observing the Sabbath. Elsewhere, however, there are cases where people are shocked by the company that Jesus keeps. The good people in his society cannot understand why, for example, he let a sinful woman wash his feet in Luke 
chapter 7? Or in Luke chapter 19, why in the world he would go and eat dinner with Zacchaeus, the tax collector? It's just not right. You can hear them thinking in the text. Godly people just don't associate with those types. I mean, sometimes, sometimes Jesus even seems to needle them about this. I mean, think about the story of the Good Samaritan. Arguably the most famous of all of the stories in Luke's Gospel. Jesus could have made the hero of that story anybody that he wanted. The good Judean, the good Galilean, but he made it about a good Samaritan, a hated Samaritan. And this, I think, illustrates what I am getting at, that over and over again, Jesus shows that he is not, he is not all that interested in sussing out the right from the wrong, the good people from the bad people, so that he can then spend his time focusing on the good people who know and do what is right. It's not that right and wrong don't matter. Of course they do. But in the moment, if somebody's hungry, they need to eat. If somebody's injured, they need to be made well. If somebody loves him, wants to follow him, wants to invite him into their home, into their life, Jesus is more than happy to welcome them with open arms. Anybody anywhere, anytime. Everything else is secondary. This morning we read some from the beginning of Luke 6 and we read a little from the end of Luke 6. But we could have read the whole thing this same theme runs all the way through this chapter. I mean, here's some of the verses that we skipped. Love your enemies, Jesus says. If you only love those who love you, what good is that? Be merciful, just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Don't judge, don't condemn, forgive. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Why do you focus on the speck of dust in your neighbor's eye, but you do not notice the two-by-four that is sticking out of your own? Over and over again, Jesus is trying to tell the people around him, the insiders, the outsiders, his followers, his skeptics, anybody who is within earshot, to stop all of this. To stop because the kingdom of God is bigger than this. He is bigger than this. His church is bigger than this. And that's a gospel that I think we could all stand to hear again these days. Some of you know this, and I hope that most of you know this, and that what I am about to say is not going to come as a surprise, but next Sunday, August 4th, is my last Sunday here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. On Monday, August 5th, my family and I will leave New York City and head back south to start life afresh in the Carolinas. I was working on the details of this move the other day when I was reminded of a conversation that my wife Rebecca had years ago. We, we were at a party back in my hometown in South Carolina. Rebecca ended up having a conversation with a friend's mom. And this woman was telling her about what it was like early on in their marriage for she and her husband to go live in England for a couple of years. 
Anyway, she told Rebecca that she and I, if we ever got the chance, should move away from the South and go live somewhere else for a while because it would change our entire outlook on life back home. We would learn things that we just couldn't learn where we were. Things about the world, things about ourselves. But just as importantly, she said, we would come back with new eyes, able to see our home as familiar as it all might still be, because things don't change so fast down there. We would be able to see our home in ways that we would not be able to otherwise. As I get ready to head back south, I can definitely say that I have learned some things from my time in New York City. I know what a schmear is. I know when and how to holler back door at a bus driver. I know that the teenagers on the sidewalk in front of my building aren't really trying to get down to a basketball tournament in Miami because the same kids have been trying to get down to the same tournament for four years now. I know that when you drive in Manhattan, you find a cabbie and you use him like a fullback. If he goes left, you go left. If he speeds up, you speed up. If you stay on his bumper, then everything will be okay. (laughs) I know that you always avoid the conspicuously empty subway car. Because in New York City, as in life, some things really are too good to be true. I have had to learn how to always walk with one eye down on the sidewalk because people here do not always clean up after their dogs. I've learned how to kvetch. I've done some kvetching about the dog poop on the sidewalk. I've been kvetching here recently about having to leave. All of you so soon. I've not yet learned how to appreciate the look of long black sandals under uh, long black socks under sandals, but I was only here for eight years, and from the looks of things, that one takes a little bit longer uh, to acquire. So I've learned some things. And yes, I am also going home with a new set of eyes, able to see things there that I might not have been able to see before. But that is not just about the South. That is also about the church. As much as I have learned from New York City, brothers and sisters, I have learned so much more from all of you. I have seen before me these last few years an example of a church that takes seriously its calling as church. As people who have been called together by God's word, as people who have been knit together by God's spirit, because y'all, let's face it, that's about all we have in common here. We are not a neighborhood church. We have regular members from four of the five boroughs and from several towns in New Jersey. For a while, in case you don't know, we had all five boroughs, but the family who lived there moved. Which, by the way, are there any visitors here who live in Staten Island? If so, come see me afterwards. We need you. (laughs) We're not an ethnic church. Martin Luther King once famously said that the single most... Uh, The single most segregated hour in America is 11 a.m. on Sundays. Not here. Not here. We are African American and Chinese American and Anglo American and Puerto Rican. We have people from Russia and Uzbekistan and Ukraine and Indonesia. Y'all, we are so open and inclusive that we actually let a Tar Heel lead us in worship sometimes. (laughs) 
and you want to talk about offending religious sensibilities? <laughs> we even have a choir member who is fluent in Tagalog. <laughs> We're barely even a Baptist church. I'm very glad Cheryl Dudley's not here to hear me say that, but it's true. A number of us grew up Baptist. But a whole lot of others of us grew up Catholic or Pentecostal or Jewish or Muslim or Methodist or Presbyterian or in some other church, in some other place, in some other tradition. But when we all gather in this house, when we gather in this room, when we gather as God's people, we gather as family. And everything else is just details. Are we perfect? You can answer that for yourselves, but I know that I'm not. Do we each come here with cares and concerns, with things that we need to work on about ourselves? Areas of our lives that need a blessing? Again, you can answer that for yourselves, but I know that I do. But those things, those are details. They can be figured out. It's not that they are unimportant, but it is that they are not allowed to stand in the way of our fellowship, in the way of our communion with one another. We come here and the Spirit moves. We go to one another's home or we go together out on a mission project and the Spirit moves moves and it works y'all do me a favor really quickly look look around look yeah, seriously I'm serious everybody look look to the person on your left look to the person on your right if they're if they're el if they're dozing off elbow them if you don't mind really quickly <laughs> look at the people in front of you behind you look look at the choir take all of it in and then hear me say this, Madison Avenue Baptist Church does not make sense outside of the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit. It doesn't. And yet here we are walking together, talking together, laughing together, loving one another. All other societal pressures to the contrary, all other temptations in this city set aside, we gather together here each week because we know that this is where we are supposed to be. We know that these are the people that we are supposed to be with. And it's good. And it's church. A good tree doesn't bear bad fruit, Jesus tells us. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Each tree can be known by its fruit. Brothers and sisters, behold all of the good fruit in this place. Take it in and recognize it for what it is, evidence that it is growing upon a good tree. Evidence of the goodness of of this place, evidence of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in this place, in this body of believers. Take it in and claim it. Claim it as your own and claim your place within it. The ways in which it has blessed you and the ways in which you are called to be a blessing to your brothers and sisters. And don't ever let anybody tell you otherwise. And don't ever let anybody try to take it away from you. Because it is good. And it is a blessing. You are a blessing. And over these last five years, you have absolutely blessed me. So thanks to all of you. And thanks be to God. Amen.
As the ushers come forward to distribute the plates, now is the time in our service when we are all uh, invited and encouraged to support the missions and ministries here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. Our closing hymn this morning is number 464, God of Grace and God of Glory. Let us remain as we are and sing together hymn number 464.
Thank you so much for being here this morning. If you are a guest, then we thank you as well. Please stick around, have something to eat, have something to drink. Introduce yourself to us. Let us know whatever questions you have about this good and gracious church. If you are joining us over the internet, thank you for doing that as well. And if you're ever able, stop by, introduce yourself to us. Let us get to know you as you have come to know us a little bit through these, our services. Um, I suspect that I will have more to say next week. Uh, But if not, uh, I love all of you. It has been an extraordinary gift and blessing to not just serve you as a minister, but be served by you as friends. Uh, And like so many good and gracious gifts from God, this place seemed to fall out of heaven and into my lap four or five years ago. Uh, I could not be more grateful to God for that. I could not be more grateful to all of you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. And now as we go forward from this place to love and to serve our Lord, let us do so with this benediction on our minds and in our hearts. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.